Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Meaning of Catholic, and this is the Paleocrat Diaries on The Meaning of Catholic. I'll be your host for today, part 14 of the Ecumenical Councils. If you look at my front door over here, you can't tell if it's day or night. What do I have in my mug? I'm not telling. Coffee? Maybe. Bourbon? Maybe. Maybe both. <laughs> it's good to be back. I had to take a few weeks off. We had some illness running through our family, through our whole parish as a matter of fact. And then I had some uh, home repairs that just couldn't wait. So, uh, I apologize. Wittershins, Sean, sorry guys. Uh, I know it was supposed to be Tuesday, but here we are. It's Saturday when it premieres. What are we doing today? Well, as Tim mentioned in part 10 of Pope Benedict Vindicates the Trads, little hat tip to your boy. We're going to be looking at the lead up to the Third Council of Constantinople. This is, in fact, part 14. And we try to view things, just like uh, Senor Flanders said, from a historical perspective, so that when we evaluate the councils as ontological realities, we've got all the information. It is utterly ridiculous to say that every council was entirely pristine and all of the bishops there were just such well-mannered gentlemen and shepherds leading their flocks. I think we know better. We know better. And that's my, my, my goal here is to pull back the curtain a little bit, to reveal the inner workings, right? I thought maybe it would be more theological, but it's turning out to be a lot more historical, which is kind of neat. Anyhow, I should be quiet. Well, about this part anyways. Let me turn the awesome music down. Let me take a sip of my mystery beverage. Mm. I'm going to locate my outline. There it is. If you're hearing background noise, I apologize. Heavy rain's going on right now. Heavy rains. Uh, you may not be hearing it. I, I, I can't tell. Anyhow, so where did we leave off? I believe I left you in somewhere maybe in the late 650s, looking at Emperor Constans II's treatment of Pope Eugene, or his threats, rather, to Pope Eugene, and to St. Maximus the confessor. Now, Eugene died before Constans could really do anything to him, and that was in June of 657. Maximus, however, did not escape the wrath of this eh, pretty wicked emperor, right? From what I read, he took everything personally. He thought if you were opposed to his imperial policies, that means you were attacking him as a person. And he was also very egotistical, maybe a little bit narcissistic. And so he just thought everything he does was perfect and pure. And if you're not in agreement with me, you're the problem here. So when Maximus stood up to him, doctrinally speaking, politically speaking, well, Maximus had to face some consequences. In 656, he's drugged back to Constantinople, Constantinople for a trial. Now, this would be similar in nature to the trial of Pope St. Martin, who they, they kidnapped him, basically, brought him to Constantinople, trumped up some charges and said, ah, we're condemning you because you sent a bunch of money to the Arabs and you assisted this guy, uh, Olympias, who was going to take over the empire. This was an insurrection. Martin knew right away that this is not about any of that stuff because that's made up. And Maximus was the same. They said, well, you defy the emperor by supporting a usurper, an insurrectionist. He says, um show me. When did I do this? Oh, years ago in Africa, you, you supported a man and you wrote a letter and you said that he should take the throne. And Maximus says to his accusers, make with the letter. Show me. And I will gladly admit to my wrongdoing. Well, naturally, they couldn't. They try to convince him by using mm, veiled threats, pressure, right? So, the fake charges didn't quite work. 
Well, Maximus, don't you value peace? Why can't we all just get along? What's the big deal about this monothelitism? Why can't we just say one will, two wills, who cares? Don't even talk about it. Maximus knew that to remain silent about the truths of the gospel was to betray Christ. You can't have peace at the expense of betraying our Lord. And this great saint stood by his convictions. So all these tactics, they were ineffective. He remained steadfast. Maximus was not sentenced to death, but rather exile. But exile after he had been mutilated. They cut off his right hand, and they attempted to cut out his tongue. That wasn't very successful. His tongue somehow healed, perhaps miraculously, and he was still able to speak. But his right hand, why would they do that? So he could no longer write brilliant theology. So they tried to get him, tried to keep him from reading, writing, speaking, and promoting what we now know is the Orthodox faith. This punishment is how he earned his name, the Confessor, St. Maximus, the Confessor, because he confessed the faith in the face of what could have been martyrdom. He was exiled to the Caucasus and died in 662 AD. Now, around this time, Martin's gone, Eugene is gone, Maximus is out of the picture. There's a new pope in Rome, by the way, since 657, uh, actually a pretty worthy successor of Peter. His name is Vitalian. Uh, he reigns from 657 to 672. In the beginning of his reign, he's a bit moderate, right? A little more conciliatory toward the emperor, Constans II. He's seen what's happened to his predecessors. He clearly values his life. Constans, uh, in the early 660s, wants to move his administration from Constantinople to somewhere in Italy, possibly Syracuse in Sicily, which was a, a Byzantine territory at the time. He stops in Rome in 663. Now, if I were Pope Vitalian, and here comes Constans, the guy who roasted Martin, roasted Maximus, and would have done so to Eugene had Eugene not died, I might be a little nervous, maybe. But apparently the visit was rather pleasant. Vitalian and Constans got along pretty well. Again, the Pope was conciliatory toward him, and Constans returned the favor <laughs> by taking all of the copper off of the buildings of Rome and shipping it back to Constantinople. Could you imagine that? They're having a big parade. They're walking through the streets. Wow, it's really raining out there. Uh, Vitalian and Constans maybe on horseback, just waving, maybe in a chariot being pulled along. And then behind them, he's like, don't forget, get the gutters. Get those tiles off of that roof over there. And then the people of Rome like, wait, what's he doing? Why is he? But what about the... He's the emperor. I guess he can do what he wants. Anyway, so Constans wants to move the imperial administration back to Italy. It seems like he wants to make Syracuse the capital. The officials in Constantinople were not real keen on this. For whatever reason, Constans left anyway, but they, the officials in the current capital, Second Rome, they detained his wife and children. They detained his family. And Constans didn't punish them. Hmm. Which... Perhaps uh, one professor, uh, Richards, Jeffrey Richards, sees this as proof that Constans did, in fact, want to move the capital and proof that there was significant enough resistance that he knew he wouldn't be successful. So he didn't even try to argue against bringing his wife and kids to Italy, right? Again, 
not a real awesome guy. Did he even miss them? We don't know. We hope he did. Years go by. Constans living in Italy. In 668, after five years or so of pretty heavy taxation, right? Theft of precious metals, uh, probably some micromanaging in there. Constanz's number was up. He was taking a bath one day, getting all sudsy, right? And evidently, he got some soap in or near his eyes, couldn't quite see, and his attendants took this opportunity to beat him to death with a silver bucket. Maybe not exactly fair. I mean, the man was presumably nude and he couldn't see. You know, when you get soap in your eye, it kind of burns a little. You'd be like, can you help? Can you give me a towel? Bam! Ah! Ugh. I don't know what to say about that. Well, he died, naturally. And Mizesius, one of the conspirators, perhaps the one wielding the silver bucket, he proclaims himself emperor. Now, remember Pope Vitalian, initially conciliatory toward Constance II, a fairly moderate pope and a good man, as far as I can tell. He persuaded the people of Rome not to support Mezesius, the usurper, not to take up arms with him and rebel against the lawful emperor who would be the son of Constance II, the, the boy he left back in Constantinople, and this is Constantine IV. If you're a very observant or perhaps astute listener of this series, you'll notice that the last time I mistakenly said Constantine IV a couple of times when I should have said Constance II. Oh well, Constance is dead now, so I don't feel too bad about it. Constantine IV, emperor, gathers an army and makes his way to the Italian peninsula. He sails from Constantinople, but by the time he arrives, Mezesius is dead and the rebellion had been put down. In large part due to Pope Vitalian's influence. Again, he persuaded the Romans don't do this. We have a lawful heir to the throne. We don't need another civil war. So the political trouble is ended for now. The theological trouble, however, remains. Vitalian, as I mentioned, he died just a few years later in 672. The next pope, Adeodatus, pope from 672, to 676, uh, he and Vitalian in succession had each refused communion with the successive patriarchs of Constantinople on account of their unorthodox statements of faith. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, probably several times, that when a pope or patriarch was elected, they would circulate a profession of faith, as it were, to let everybody know Here's who I am. I've been elected. Here's what I'm all about. Well, the word they were receiving in Rome from the patriarchs in Constantinople was not impressive. And the popes did not enter into communion with these men. They leaned monothelite and they didn't recant. At one point, Theodore, the patriarch of Constantinople, even moved to take Vitalian off of the diptychs. Right? This is tantamount to excommunication. It would be a schismatic thing to do, to take the Pope out of the liturgy. Whoa. And he wanted, Theodore wanted to put Pope Honorius back on. Honorius will come up again in, in a short while. Constantine IV rejected this idea. He never forgot Vitalian's loyalty during the rebellion of Mezesius, right? The murderer of his father, whom the Pope uh, withheld support, and therefore the Romans withheld support. Constantine did not forget that. He was forever indebted to the papacy in a certain sense. 
And so he rejected Theodore's idea of taking Vitalian off of the diptychs, and he deposed Theodore as Patriarch of Constantinople. He put in his place George, George I, I think, George I. Don't quote me on that. At this point, Constantine has reason, pretty good reason, to reconsider this um, policy, the imperial policy of silence regarding the monothelite heresy. What was the point of it in the first place? Well, if you recall, all those years ago, 40 years or so prior, Sergius, the patriarch of Constantinople, and Heraclius, the emperor at the time, they said, you know, we need to try to reconcile these monophysites. We need to preserve the unity in Christendom. We're suffering attack from the Persians, from the Arabs. We've got uh, a lot of problems going on, and internal strife is really not helping things. So everybody get along, and shh. Constantine looks at the situation now in the 670s, right? Almost, well, 50 years after Muhammad, right? 40 years after uh, Islam starts to really spread. All of the lands within which the Monophysite Christians dwell are pretty much controlled by the Muslims, meaning they're not even really in the empire anymore. So why are we trying to reconcile with them? At the expense of persistently ticking off the West. The West is not out of our reach. The Oriental areas of the Roman Empire, they're pretty well gone. I mean, they're there, but they're not under our control. So to bring them back into imperial unity on matters of doctrine doesn't make a lot of sense. So maybe we can abandon this policy of silence regarding the monothelite heresy. And as a secondary concern, maybe it's actually heresy. <laughs> uh, maybe we shouldn't be saying it anyway, regardless of the political concerns. I have to imagine, as much as I like Constantine IV, that that was a secondary concern, and that the unity of the empire, the stability, the strength, right, civil, uh, avoiding civil wars and, and things of that nature, I have to imagine that was the primary concern. All right. Uh, covered that, covered that, boom. So here we go. Constantine IV took it upon himself to write to the Pope. Now, Adeodatus had died in 676. The man to whom Constantine wrote was a man named Donus. Okay, Donus was Pope for a couple of years, almost two years. And he suggests, you know, Holy Father, we need a council. We need East and West to come together, and let's talk about this uh, monothelitism, and let's, let's hash it out, let's see where orthodoxy lies, and then we'll do that. And everybody will have had their voices heard, and it'll all be so great. Donus didn't answer right away. Okay, Remember, communication back and forth kind of takes a while, right? Pretty significantly uh, delay due to weather and terrain and, oh, the pirates and the robbers and all that. Okay. So, Donus doesn't respond right away, and the Patriarch of Constantinople wants to remove him from the diptychs also. And again, Constantine's like, no, stop it. Leave the popes in the liturgy. Turns out, Donus had died. Agatho, Saint Agatho, he was now pope since Donus's death in 678. It's Agatho who responds to the letter to Constantine IV. He very much agrees to a council, but he wants to convene local synods in the West first. He wants to gauge the disposition of the Western bishops vis-a-vis -vis monothelitism. In 680, a lot of these synods had met. 
won uh, significantly one in Milan under, uh, I forget the fellow's name. I believe he was the Archbishop of Ravenna. Could be wrong about that. And another one under Patriarch, excuse me, Archbishop Theodore of Canterbury took place in Hethfield in England. It's unfortunate that Theodore of Canterbury couldn't make it to the council. He was uh, evidently a very brilliant theologian, and it's a shame that he couldn't make the journey nonetheless. So you have these significant local Western synods all sending to Rome their findings, as it were, what is the apostolic faith. And they all agree that monothelitism is not it, that Christ has two natural wills, a divine will and a human will. All of the bishops in the West agree that Scripture and the fathers attest to this. One person, two natures, two wills. This, I might add, this is how synodality is supposed to work. Okay, uh, Bishops, what's the faith? Okay, thank you. Yep, that's what we thought. Check. Simple as that. Simple as that. So Agatho responds back to Constantine the Fourth. He writes a very strongly worded letter. He is sure to explain that the Catholic faith is that Christ has two natural wills. Again, as I just explained, a divine will, a human will, and Agatho, Saint Agatho, venerated in the East and the West. He says something rather shocking to modern ears. He says, the apostolic see has never swerved from the true faith. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. Agatho makes the claim to Constantine IV that the see of Rome has never swerved from the true faith. Hence, the image on the thumbnail. Now, did Agatho have a memory problem? What about Honorius? Hmm. Well, we'll see. Agatho, uh, in fidelity to his promise to send legates, he sends a number of them, as a matter of fact, to the capital to have this discussion that Constantine IV wanted to have. And apparently, uh, I didn't realize this at first, but upon research, the council wasn't intended to be ecumenical, but it turned out the three patriarchates in uh, Mohammedan lands also sent delegates or were personally present. So now we've got all five patriarchs present or represented. Okay, Constantine the Fourth is like, whoa, ecumenical, yes, let's do that. Uh, let's see. So Antioch, they sent their patriarch, Macarius. Jerusalem and Alexandria sent legates. So three of the five patriarchal sees send legates. The patriarch of Constantinople was obviously present, as was, uh, what's his name? Macarius. Macarius of Antioch was also present. Now, Macarius, he's an interesting character. He's actually a little more monothelite, and he's going to be the reason why Honorius is important. Hmm. Okay, so George of Constantinople is present, Macarius is present, the legates, the Roman legates, the Jerusalem legates, the Alexandrian legates. The council opens November 7th, 680, with 43 bishops. Yay, 43 bishops. Not very ecumenical if you think about the 2,000-something that were at Vatican II. However, again, given travel constraints at the time uh, and uh, the fact that a lot of the Western bishops couldn't make it for various reasons, the bishops of the Orient couldn't make it for various reasons, it's not altogether surprising. What makes an ecumenical council, by the way, is not the number of participants. We'll come to that in the future. 
All right. So let's see, where was I? Ah, yes. The papal legates, John of Porto, Bishop of Porto, who was senior among them, begin the council first session by demanding that the East explain their attachment to monothelitism and monoenergism. Remember, that's one will, one energy in the person of Christ. George and Macarius, these two Eastern patriarchs, they both reply, we're just teaching what the tradition says, as defined by the holy councils. Hmm. Wait a minute. Which ones? Since when? What are you reading, George? Hmm. In the first four sessions of Constantinople III, all of the previous acts, all the acts of the previous councils were read aloud. Okay? This includes Nicaea, Constantinople I, Ephesus, Chalcedon, and Constantinople II. Now, in this batch of documents, there was allegedly a letter, well, there was a letter, allegedly from Sergius, the patriarch of Constantinople way back in the day, to Pope Vigilius. Remember, he died in 555. And this letter allegedly supports monothelitism. And the evidence was brought forth that, well, Vigilius accepted it. Rome accepted this a long time ago. I don't know why you guys are making a big deal out of it now. But upon scrutiny, it was determined that the letter was a forgery. It was fraudulent. So by the time they get through, the council fathers, they get through these first four sessions, it's not looking real good for the monothelite heretics, people like Macarius of Antioch. In the fifth and the sixth session, Macarius produces a dossier of patristic texts that support what he's saying, or so he claims. These documents were sealed up in the presence of the imperial representatives and taken away for later review. Okay, The imperial commissioner said, okay, you brought what? And you've got a bunch of patristic, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Hang on, let me just wrap this up some kind of who knows what. And we're just going to set it aside. We'll get to that later. So tell me more, Macarius. Tell me about this apostolic monothelitism. We're very interested. Mm. Okay. In the seventh session of Constantinople III, the papal legates, again, Bishop John of Porto, senior among them, produce their own batch of of documents, patristic texts, scriptural citations and commentaries, etc., etc., that support what they are saying, right? That support against, or rather, deny monothelitism. These were also sealed. These were also set aside and taken away for examination. The eighth session. George of Constantinople, initially maybe a little caught off guard. What do you mean? I've just been preaching the apostolic faith this whole time. Ha <laughs> ha. He says, you know, I think the legates from Rome are correct. I'm pretty sure that this is the true faith. Hmm. George's suffragans concurred. And they restored Agatho's name to the diptychs. Apparently, somebody took it off. Macarius, however, would not admit it. He dug in deeper, right? This is part of the problem with heretics. After being corrected, what truly makes them sinful, obstinate heretics is that they're not docile to the Holy Ghost. They dig their heels in, they make their stand, right? I keep thinking of Martin Luther, here I stand, blah, blah, blah. Good for you, big guy. Good for you. If only you would have submitted yourself to the judgment of the church. Macarius, the same way. He stated he would rather be torn to pieces and thrown into the sea than to admit two wills in Christ. 
That's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. And if that were orthodox, that would be laudable, right? Wow, this guy wants to stand up for, hmm, yeah, not quite. Why did he think this? Why was he so stubborn? Well, he thought it was Nestorian to say two wills in Christ, and Nestorius was condemned at Ephesus. Hmm. In the ninth session of this council, it was determined, remember, they took those documents away for scrutiny. They had them sealed up, and they had uh, neutral parties examine them. The Roman dossier, the Antiochene dossier, and turns out, wouldn't you know it, Macarius and his associates falsified or significantly twisted the patristic sources that they cited. They were taken out of context. They were given meanings that were contrary to what had been handed down from all ages. The imperial archivists compared the Antiochene dossier to their own archives. They're like, wait, he, Saint so-and-so said that? Wait a minute. Hang on. Check that. No, he did it. Wait, this passage means what? Hold on. No, it doesn't. What are you doing here, Macarius? Proof texts, proof texting, twisting, manipulating, forging. Terrible. The council then removes Macarius's faculties. They depose him as patriarch of Antioch and his little buddy Stephen. Sorry, Stephen. In the tenth session. The Roman dossier is determined to be authentic, orthodox, and legitimate. It's accurate. Their papers say this. Our archives say this. They claim this is what it means. This is what this means. Everything coheres. It's remarkable. That's how tradition works. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to make it up. You look to the past. What did that mean? Okay, well, there we go. That's what it means. Not to say doctrine doesn't develop. Of course it does. But it doesn't contradict. And that's the key. The next two sessions, the 11th and 12th, were dedicated to the trial, the official trial of Macarius and his little buddy, Stephen, Stevo. His personal writings were brought forward. Some of them were deemed to be heretical. And again, Macarius is deposed as the patriarch of Antioch. A man named Theophanes is selected to replace him, right? He's unrepentant to the end. As far as I can tell, he and Stephen did not reconcile with the church. In the 13th session, here's where it gets interesting. So apparently, part of Macarius's argument was that, well, Rome teaches that there's only one will in Christ. See, I have here a letter from a certain Pope Honorius. You know, Honorius I, Pope from 625 to 638 AD. He kind of wrote a little bit to Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. You remember. And he kind of says one will in Christ. Hmm. What do you say to that, Roman legates? Because Macarius depended so heavily on this letter of Honorius, well, clearly the letter must be heretical, or so they thought. So in the 13th session, all of the heretics are condemned. Sergius, Cyrus, Pyrrhus, Paul, Peter, not the apostles, clearly the patriarchs of Constantinople, Theodore, and Honorius. So here you have, to my knowledge, the first time that a pope is explicitly condemned as a heretic by an ecumenical council. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of makes you wonder about Agatho's letter. Hmm. Rome's unswerving faith. Hmm. We'll see. So... Can a council do that? I mean, they kind of did. What do we make of this? Hold that thought. In this same session, the 13th session, 
Sophronius of Jerusalem, remember that holy monk turned patriarch, his letters were examined and determined to be entirely orthodox. Theophanes in the 14th session is installed as patriarch of Antioch and in well, let me just pause here. The next two sessions, the 15th and 16th sessions, these really aren't material to the work of the council, but they're just so odd. I couldn't help but mention it. In the 15th session, a priest named Polychronius, who was a Monothelite, he swore that he could raise a man from the dead to prove that monothelitism was true. And the bishops were like, go ahead. So they brought him a corpse. They said, yeah, go ahead, big guy. They brought him a corpse, and he pinned a monothelite confession of faith to this corpse and whispered in his ear for two hours. Two hours. As a policeman, I've been around my fair share of deceased individuals. I would never whisper in their ear for two hours. That's weird. It's gross. At the end of this session, if we can call it that, the only thing that changed was Polychronius's standing as a priest. In the next session, another odd priest attempted to explain the view that Christ had abandoned his human will on the cross as he entered into glory. And he was also condemned. So what does that really have to do with anything? I'm not sure, but it was entertaining. In the 17th session, the penultimate session, the bishops finalized their confession of faith which was solemnly promulgated 16 September 681. So this council has lasted over 10 months. September 16th, by the way, is the anniversary of Pope St. Martin's martyrdom. Now, the final documents, they show a balance between Leo and Cyril of Alexandria. Leo the Great, Pope of Rome and Cyril of Alexandria. These final documents were signed by 174 bishops, and a good summary of them goes as follows. In a moment, mystery beverage time. Mm. So first, they exchange some pleasantries regarding the orthodoxy of the emperor, oh, most pious Christian lord, uh, blah, blah, blah. Next, a solemn acceptance of the previous five general councils, uh, which are previously named in this episode. Then, explicit adherence to the creeds of Nicaea and Constantinople I. Then, the list of heretics, Sergius, Cyrus, Pyrrhus, Peter, Paul, Theodore, and Honorius. And I think they threw in all the others too, Arius and Apollinaris and Nestorius and Dioscorus and blah, blah, blah. Okay. The legates, they didn't raise an issue. At least it doesn't seem that they did. One source, uh, Monsignor Philip Hughes, explains the lengthy delay in concluding the council by saying, well, it must be the case that the Roman legates wanted to negotiate how exactly are we going to condemn Honorius? What are we going to say? What are we going to say that he did? Right? We don't want to lie, but we also don't want to just blanket the sea of Rome unnecessarily. Now, it so happens that Agatho died in March of 681, six months before the council concluded. And the next pope, Leo II, before he was confirmed, it seems that Constantine IV wanted to ensure that Leo was going to play ball the way Agatho was playing ball. Leo, I need to know 
that you're on board with the work of the council, that you're not going to pick it up and run with it in a different direction, right? We've had popes die in the midst of councils before, right? Uh, John the 23rd opens Vatican II, he dies, Paul the VI finishes it out. People would disagree. Some say yes, some say no. Did Paul VI accomplish the desires of John the 23rd? Well, it's that same situation in the 680s. Is Leo going to pick up where Agatho left off? Or is he going to go his own way? So Constantine wants to make sure that Leo is going to support the council, to condemn monothelitism, and that might have to include Honorius, because we kind of deposed the Patriarch of Antioch over it, and he kept citing Honorius, so if we just leave that out there, that's a chink in the armor. and We can't have that. So Honorius is on the list of heretics. But oddly enough, the letter of Agatho to Constantine IV is inserted into the documents of the council. The very one that says Rome has never swerved from the faith. So in the, literally the same council, same bishops, same group of guys, they're like, oh, Pope heretic. Oh, Pope never erred in faith. Or is that what they said? Is it possible that Honorius could be personally guilty in some way and the see of Rome preserved pristine in the apostolic doctrines. Hmm. There's also in the final documents a rehashing of Leo the Great's tome and the main points therein. And then there's a statement clarifying that there are two wills in the person of Christ. Finally, a statement of Cyrillian Christology. This is a pretty comprehensive body of documentation produced by these 170-something bishops at Constantinople III. And the church is now at peace for a few more years, or so it seems. Let me get a time check. 42 minutes? A little more. I've got some more to say. I've got more mystery beverage here. Hmm. So continuing with this historical reality surrounding Constantinople III. Remember, I kind of left the question open, what makes a council ecumenical? Father Francis Sullivan, S.J., and I'm not ashamed to say it because he's a brilliant man, he says, general agreement and ratification by Rome. That's the key. Does Rome accept it as ecumenical? Because you could go through all the councils of the past and what makes one ecumenical and another one not, and the criteria, they're all over the place. Does it have to be everybody represented? Because if that's the case, almost none of the early councils would count. Does it have to be some from the East and some from the West? Well, then that rules out uh, Constantinople I. Does it have to be summoned by the emperor? No. But what we find is that for every council that is considered ecumenical by the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is that acceptance by Rome. That's what makes a council ecumenical. So we kind of need that. And Constantine knew that. He knew he needed Leo, hence the delay. I need Leo II to sign on to this. Agatho had died. Leo took his place. Leo ratifies the conciliar decrees and the condemnations. Apparently, however, a little side note here, Macarius, the patriarch of Antioch, he goes to Rome. He appeals his deposition. Why wouldn't he go to any of the other patriarchs? Why wouldn't he go to George? Why wouldn't he go to Jerusalem or Alexandria? He goes to Rome. 
he must have known something about Rome's primacy, perhaps about Rome's jurisdiction. Anyhow, Leo said, um, yeah, you're still condemned. Sorry, bro. And he and Stephen and whoever else went with them, except for two. There were two who did re actually recant, and they were admitted back into communion with the church. Other than those two, whose names we don't know, everybody else was confined to a monastery. Kind of, actually not a bad sentence. If I were going to be exiled and, and deposed and, and punished in some way, confining me to a monastery may not be the worst thing after all, right? I guess it depends. Now, Leo, Leo II, when solidifying the condemnation of Honorius, he's going to give this thing its final shape. He writes to the emperor, and he makes a certain statement. Uh, in this letter, naturally, of course, it, it can't just be easy. I'd like it to just be easy. Oh, this is what he said. This is what everybody thought. Oh, great. Everything was great. There's two versions of the letter, and they don't say the same thing. <laughs> there's a Latin version, and there's a Greek version. Okay. In all probability, Leo wrote the original in Greek. He was from Sicily, where Greek was still the most common language. This was a Byzantine territory. It was also, the letter was addressed to a native Greek speaker. So if Leo knew Greek, and he knew that Constantine knew Greek, it makes sense to write the letter in Greek. And I should add, his other letters in Latin to the Spanish bishops reflect the meaning of his Greek letter to Constantine. So although the letter to the emperor exists in two forms, it seems that the Greek version is more accurate. This is important because of what it says about Honorius. So, are we accepting the condemnation of a prior pontiff? It seems so. Are we accepting that Rome has never swerved from the true faith? It seems so. How to make these work together? In, which is this? Aha. So in both versions of the letter, here's about what it says. Uh, Leo, again, to Constantine IV. We anathematize, list of heretics, and also Honorius, who did not purify this apostolic church, but rather, in the Greek version, he allowed the immaculate church to be stained, or in the Latin version, but rather attempted to subvert the immaculate faith. Attempted in the Latin text, allowed in the Greek text. The Greek text is more consonant with Leo II's other letters to Western bishops, probably wrote it in Greek for the reasons I gave a moment ago. Why the discrepancy? allowed, attempted. These are clearly not the same. One is very passive. One is sort of active. I'm attempting to subvert the orthodox faith. That makes me a heretic. I'm allowing someone or something to stain the Immaculate Church. That makes me perhaps negligent. Am I materially or formally a heretic, though? Uh, debatable. Debatable. Does it matter? Kind of. Are we going to say that Honorius was a formal heretic and that Rome has never swerved from the apostolic faith? How could you say that? It seems clear that Leo's ratification of Constantinople III and his condemnation of Honorius is more along the lines of negligence. You allowed this perfidious doctrine, this pernicious error, to spread. You did nothing about it. We examined Honorius's letter 
uh, rather briefly, but we did, in a previous episode. And it seems that Honorius and Sergius, who was patriarch of Constantinople at the time, were not talking about the same thing. So, I am quite comfortable saying that Honorius was not, in fact, personally heterodox. Negligent, culpably negligent for defending the faith? Yes, clearly. But not a heretic the way Sergius and the others were. Hmm. After Leo II approves the text of the council and the canons, he makes copies, or probably not him, but his scribes make copies and send them around to all the Western bishops for them to sign. Therefore, the West accepted it, the East accepted it, ratified by Rome, Constantinople III, one for the record books, folks. And we'll stop there. All right. Wow, that was fun. Uh, oh, it's getting a little lighter outside. Maybe you've guessed what time of day it is here. Still not telling you what's inside. Hmm. Tasty. Last time I was remiss, I forgot to mention, if you look to the left side of your screen, you'll see the latest article that I've put on the Kaiser's website. Go to paleocratdiaries.com and read about my thoughts regarding development of doctrine and the free market, starting with Leo, uh, Leo the 13th, Rerum Novarum, and ending with uh, St. John Paul II, and an analysis, more or less, of Centesimus Annus, his encyclical in 1991. Oh my goodness, I'm running out of things to say. I suppose that's good, I should have mercy on you, you poor, poor people. 52 minutes and still, this guy was st still talking, why would he stop? Have a good Saturday, everybody. It's May 21st, 2022. And we never give up. We keep on smiling. We remember our death. God bless you.